Only those convicted of the most heinous crimes go on to face capital punishment. Renowned film director Werner Herzog became immersed in the lives and stories of these people and at the invitation of prisoners recorded a series of intimate one-on-one -on -one interviews on death row. In these extraordinary encounters, Herzog had just one hour to meet, greet, and film. Yet somehow, he managed to form a remarkable connection with the inmates. Tonight, Herzog speaks with two of the infamous Texas Seven, men who made national headlines when they broke out of a maximum security prison in 2001. Death penalty exists in 34 states of the United States of America. Currently, only 16 states actually perform executions. Executions are carried out by lethal injection. As a German, coming from a different historical background and being a guest in the United States, I respectfully disagree with the practice of capital punishment. This is the Polonsky unit in Livingston, Texas. All male death row inmates of the state, more than 300 of them, are held here. Since this unit does not have a death house, executions are carried out in Huntsville at the Walls unit, some 40 miles away. Cell blocks for those who wait to be killed look like this one. In June of 2010, I met Michael Perry here. He was executed eight days from the time of this conversation. But, you know, because I, like, I'll forget. I'll literally forget. And then I'll look at my calendar, or I'll hear someone say something, I'll be like, man. And I'll sit back and I'll just stare at the wall and I'll be like, man, eight days, seven days, six days, or whatever, and it's like, it's just, I, I, I must not be comprehending the fact that it's that close because, you know, it's hard for me to say, you know what, like I talked to people, you know, in eight days, these people want to murder me. <laughs> After our interview, used for a different film, I noticed this man, Joseph Garcia, with whom I had been in contact through letters. He was waiting to be taken back to his cell after having spoken to a reporter. Like all the men here, his mind was consumed with his impending fate. I don't know how the drugs work, per se. It's a wild concept to think about that, you know, you're gonna be put to sleep, euthanized, you know, like a dog. Does it frighten you? Yes, it does. <laughs> yes, it does. Garcia is one of the infamous Texas Seven. He is on death row for the murder of a police officer, a crime that was committed after a spectacular prison break. All of you who were involved in this escape are charged with capital murder. Basically, yeah, the law states that on um, the law parties, if you are convicted that because of your co-defendants' uh, responsibilities in that crime, that you are held responsible along with them. It's a crazy law, you know, because how can you say, you know, if you and I were doing a crime and you decided to kill somebody, how can I be responsible for what you did? You know, I wasn't so you, you you were not, you personally were not plotting, let's kill this officer who is driving up the ramp where you were uh, burglarizing a store for weapons. Exactly. I wasn't even out on the back on the back dock when that happened. You know, I was still in the I was still in the store tying up hostages. You yes. know, when that activity I mean when that yeah. when which that was bad enough, let's face it. Yeah. You have been in serious crimes, yeah. there's no doubt.
prison museum in Huntsville contains mannequins of the bad guys. The Texas 7 feature prominently among them. Here, Joseph Garcia. The mastermind, however, was George Rivas, who had a long rap sheet for robberies. I was robbing businesses with a handgun. And uh, I would either pose as security or as a late shopper and take over the store. Then uh, using the clothing of the employees there, I go and uh, empty the safe and whatever I could carry and then leave. My first conviction of the first robbery, um, I ended up with 10 aggravated life sentences for one storm. But uh, there was no murder, there was no bloodshed. No, no, what they did here in Texas, they say here in Texas that if I'm telling you that this is a robbery and one of your co-workers hears me, they count it as two robberies now. And whatever amount of employees are in the store, or customers, but there was always employees only, no customers, they charged me with an individual count of kidnapping because I told them to move from point A to point B during the commission of a crime. I came out with 10 aggravated life sentences. Consecutive? Yes, that means stacked. That means I had to do the time, which was, in 93, it was 15 years before you're eligible for parole. So I had to do 15 years on one life and then start the parole process for the second life and so on to 10. Well, in June of 95, I was uh, again tried for another robbery. And this time it was uh, again the two counts of aggravated robbery and five employees this time. Within a year and three months of being arrested in 93, I had 18 aggravated life sentences. I had more time than all mass murders in the prison system that I know of. And Did it make you angry? Did you feel uh, that this was out of proportion? I know I belonged in prison. I was robbing. And I grew up mentally here in prison. And I recognized that I did commit the crimes. I should have been, come, I should have been sentenced to prison. But I do believe that they went overboard. They took away all hope for me. And when you do that to a person, anything is possible. Some people go crazy, some people kill themselves. And other people sometimes try to do what I did later on. We now return to Werner Herzog's conversations with Joseph Garcia and George Rivas on death row. Prison rules dictate that there must be a hiatus of at least three months before any follow-up discourse with a prisoner. Authorities do not want an inmate to become a regular on TV. In our case, it was four months before we met Garcia again. In studying his case, I was interested in tracing back his life to an incident which could have happened to any one of us. The fatal night ended here, but it started harmlessly enough. After an evening in a bar, Joseph Garcia ended up at the house of a young woman together with his friend Bobby and another young man, Miguel Luna, whom he had never met before. What happened there? By the time I walked in, uh, Jocelyn was already sitting on the couch. Uh, Miguel was sitting on an armchair by himself. Bobby was sitting on the floor. So the only place I could sit was on the couch with Jocelyn. Uh, Miguel, he wasn't conversational. You know, he just sat there, watched TV. Me and Bobby were the only two talking to Jocelyn. Uh, to be honest, I like Jocelyn. Uh, there was a spark, an yeah, there immediate was, spark. There was. I mean, she was pretty. She was. She was. I mean, she was smart. She was intelligent. She, she had conversation. And she was funny. Uh, there was a time in the evening where we were sitting down, and the apartment was cold, and she didn't have any socks on. And she turned to me. And she goes, "Hey, do you mind if I put my feet under your legs?" And I was like, "Sure." You know, I was like. To and me, it felt good. Yeah, of course it did. You know, I was like, wow, you know, hey, uh, well, she likes me, you know. So, you know, I was like, well, we'll just see where this goes. You know, I'll just, I'll be cool about it. And she met me uh, in the, in the bedroom, 
and she closed the door secretly and, secretly of course yes, yes. and uh, she sat on the bed and I tell you know what's up Jocelyn what's the problem she goes well I just want to let you know if y'all leave together leave together right I don't want this guy to stay behind so I thought she was talking about Bobby right and I was like well you know Bobby brought his own vehicle I brought my own vehicle you know uh, but I'll make sure he leaves and she was like I'm not talking about Bobby I'm talking about Miguel I knew that there was something going on between these two people and the only way to anything to happen between me and her was to get him out so Bobby had left the apartment stranding him there leaving him there you know and I'm trying to tell Miguel it's time to go and the two guys jockeying for this girl you know it just happened that we ended up in the same car and as we're driving away he becomes angry with me you know we have an old saying back in San Antonio that us guys will say that it's uh, I don't want to curse on the TV or anything but it's uh, it's we bleep it out yeah it's 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 called blocking you know yes. where one guy tries to get somebody else's girl or you know that you're 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 getting in the you're getting in the way of somebody else right and uh, I believe that that's what Miguel thought was happening that I was trying to get in the way of him and Jocelyn it ended up in a fight uh, he started beating me while I was in the car driving you know and it was just I tried everything that I could do to get him off of me you know even pleading with him you know stop you know be, you know how I can't I can't protect myself while I'm driving a stick gear you know so the next thing I know is waking up because I think he got a I, he must have got a good shot because I must have passed out because the next thing I know he's sitting on top of me and he's choking me and he's hitting me and he's telling me I'm gonna fucking kill you I'm gonna kill you you know Garcia pulled the car into this parking lot. He claims that he was beaten by Luna and choked to the point of unconsciousness. When he came to, Luna had taken the car keys and was pacing around outside in a rage. I opened the door, I went to hit the seatbelt, and my back of my hand fell across the blade which was sitting on my belt horizontally. It was my butterfly knife that I just, I happened to leave on my belt that morning. Uh, I pulled it out, I extended it. I, by the time I got out of the car, it was, it was extended, it was ready. I put my hand out in front to stop him, to, mm -hmm. you know, hey, please stop. You know, just, yeah. hey, I'm trying to talk. I can barely talk, I'm, you know, I'm struggling, I'm trying to breathe and I'm, I'm bleeding from my nose and my eye and, and my lips and I'm telling him, you know, stop you know give me back my keys right you, look look man i got a knife seeing the knife miguel luna retreated into the housing complex across the street garcia followed him what spoke against you is that some people woke up and they heard you and that was very incriminating they heard you when you stabbed him uh, die mother die yeah and the real incriminating fact was that he ended up being stabbed 19 times. Uh, approaching the crime scene uh, on the sidewalk, you will find blood drops, which will eventually lead up to the body. I felt that I was innocent. I felt that Miguel had drove me to this point. You know, I, I didn't, I didn't want to kill him. It wasn't my intentions to kill him. I was protecting myself. I can remember when we were both standing in that hallway that second time and I'm telling him, please, you know, just, just give me my keys, man. I don't want to hurt you. Just give me my keys, I want to leave. And when he swung back, you know, he's like, he told me, F you, right? And he, and he swung back to, to swing at me, and I lost it. I lost it. I mean, I was like, at that moment, it just happened just like that. You know, it's like, this guy's for real. He wants to kill me. You know, he, he, he's not trying to listen to reason. He doesn't, he doesn't want me to leave. He, you know, why? You know, and then... Yes, I, I lost it. I lost it. 
I lost it. I mean, it just, I didn't, I didn't stop stabbing Miguel until he stopped moving. I can see the body in the foreground, blood smears all over the door. The only thing I could do was turn to my side and I saw this door and I, I started banging for help. You know, I, I went and knocked on her door and, or whoever's door that was. And I remember seeing like a 13A or 13B or something. And I remember knocking on the door and I just, please help, you know, send the ambulance, send an ambulance. And I, my handprint is on that door. You know, it's my handprint on that door. I, I liked the boy, but he just had a, he's, he's so excitable. He's, he just, everything he did was, uh, was not thought through. Something took over and he killed this boy, but it wasn't his real self that did, did the actual killing. And he was just, his rage had just overtaken his, his mind, as we say, was incapable of cool reflection. They had offered him a reduced sentence and uh, he wanted he claimed he was, it was self-defense, but it... Uh, there also was a pre-trial bargaining yes, agreement. there was. And what would hap have happened to Garcia in that case? In that case, it would have, they would have, uh, would have let him plead to uh, 15 years for murder. I suggested to him that it would be in his best interest accept it, but he, he, uh, he was, he wanted to, wanted to go to trial all the way. You know, Joseph Garcia was his own worst enemy. He testified, and when he testified, he sealed his fate. You want me to tell you why I remember this case so well? Please. This victim was stabbed multiple times with what is known as a butterfly knife. A butterfly knife is a difficult knife to use to assault someone. As a matter of fact, this is the only murder I've ever handled in which a butterfly knife was used. It's difficult to use because it's unwieldy unless you know how to use it very well. The steps to unfold it and to prepare it for assaulting someone are, there are multiple steps, it's elaborate, and it's not a quick process unless you're very good with that knife. Joseph Garcia in court, on trial for his life, insisted in front of the jury and demonstrating his proficiency with that butterfly knife. And he was proficient. And I think once he did it, the jury was not going to have much difficulty uh, finding him guilty. Joseph Garcia claims that he had bruises in his face mm -hmm. and had a bloodied face mm -hmm. and there were photos taken of Joseph Garcia that very night. Mm -hmm. Did you see the photos? I did. And what uh, did they look like to you? Like a man who was uninjured. And it was not self-defense in the opinion of the well, witness? Self-defense ended when the boy ran. And the result was? The result was that the jury gave him 50 years. Let me address yes. Joseph Garcia's statement that he thought his 50-year sentence was too harsh. Uh, you know, in Texas, in, in murder, it's a very unique state in that the jury can determine punishment. And the jury is given almost complete discretion for a murder. A jury can give someone probation or they can give them life and anything in between. Even probation. Even probation. You mean for first degree murder? For first Did I degree hear murder. You right? Yes. As long as you have not previously been convicted of a felony, 
if you're eligible for probate, for, if, if you've never been previously convicted. In Texas, a jury can sentence a murder defendant to probation. I'm looking back on it. Uh, if he had taken 15 years, he probably wouldn't have been involved in this prison breakout. And he'd be back today. When we come back, Joseph Garcia and George Rivas detail exactly how they and five other inmates accomplished the most notorious prison break in Texas history. And they'll tell us about their wild journey on the outside. These seven men were all together at the Connolly unit, a maximum security prison south of San Antonio. Every one of them was serving an extended sentence. They wanted out. It was a highly intelligent plan, executed with military precision, that you overpowered people without bloodshed. Yes, sir. You tricked the guard towers and everyone into uh, just letting you drive out. It was 13 officers and three inmates. Way to take over three inmates also that were not part of the plan. I'll never forget, it was the beginning of April of 2000. I was looking at myself in the mirror and I decided that day that I was not gonna die an old man in prison. I wasn't gonna let myself be killed or crippled by the officers or just die, just wither away. So I made a plan and it involved having people with me who had the same mindset that we were not gonna take out our personal issues on the officers that were gonna be involved and that I could trust when once we were out on the other side of the fence that they weren't going to continue doing anything that would hurt another person. So I began a screening process, a theoretical conversation when we're at rec or on, on the yard lifting weights or at work. And I would say, what would you do right now if you were to get out? And every person I picked said that uh, they would just try to start over and get a job, they didn't care what it was, and just make a living, just to live now, to be free. Yeah. And Joseph Garcia in particular? He was one of the first men I picked. Yeah. Reliable? Yes, reliable and loyal. Intelligent? He's intelligent and uh, very calm, very calm spirit. We planned for this for months, months. I mean, we went through scenarios in which, you know, something else could happen and we, you know, adjusted to it. The main thing is no one gets hurt. Play it smart, you know. And if you do it smart, you know the system, then hey, it's, you could just walk out of it, you know. Watching the way the system operated, I realized that the best way was going to be the most difficult way which was taking over the entire maintenance department. By taking control of maintenance, we have a better shot of basically exiting the back gate. Uh, we also knew that the back gate held all the weapons for the field bosses. When everyone went to lunch, uh, I kept the crew behind to continue working in the back, the back dock. We had one supervisor with us. You mean the officers who went one to lunch? Officer. Yeah. Well, the officers and inmates. The other, the other workers in maintenance. And uh, when they lent, went to lunch, we subdued the first officer, and he's the one that stabbed one of ours, and he's the one that got hurt, that got hit. And then we bandaged him up and put him in the room. We took his clothing, and then we got ready for the rest, because now all the other officers are going to be coming back from lunch. And they came back in twos and threes. So we were outnumbered, so what we did was wrestled them. We basically had three teams. Uh, me and one other man were the primary team to take them down. When we were outnumbered, the second team took down whoever else. And then the third team was taking their clothes off and tying them up and putting them in a room. And it was hectic. It was a very hectic time. And at the same time, I'm answering the phone that's calling back there. And uh, actually called in the count. When they called in for the count time at one o'clock, which is what I was waiting for. I had to call that in. 
And uh, once we had all the officers subdued and we had their clothing and I called the count in, then I called the back gate and the back tower and let them know that a maintenance crew was going back there. Garcia at this time was calling the guard tower and I had one of the men calling what they called the dog house. I told them the moment you see me walk inside that guard house, make the phone calls. So Garcia was calling the guard tower and he allowed me in. I walked in and uh, the phone's ringing and the officer in there says, hey, uh, yeah, he just walked up right now. And he hands me the phone and says, it's for you. And I asked him, who is it? And he says, I don't know. I think it's maintenance. And I said, what do they want? I just came from there. We're playing the little thing, the role. So I answered the phone and uh, we start talking. And I said, oh, you want the serial number? So I have a part in my hand and I start reading the serial number. While I'm doing this, I'm watching out the window to make sure there's no delivery trucks arriving. And I said, okay, Max, I'll talk to you later then. And I put the phone down. The word Max or Maximize was our word. When he told him Maximize on the phone, Chino and the other two men took over the officer downstairs. Well, when I put the phone down, there was a 357 Magnum, among many others, in a holster. I grabbed it out of the holster and I asked the officer, is this loaded? And he looked surprised, said, of course it's loaded. I flipped open the cylinder, saw it was loaded, closed it, and I said, okay then, all I want is your cooperation now. I have control of your guard tower. The only thing remaining, how would they all get out together in a single pickup truck? Me and one of the men had made a false bottom in the maintenance truck. It looked like trash, but when they picked up the trash, there were two wooden double doors, like barn doors that they could hide under. So any guard tower looking down sees a bunch of trash. Well, when you open the tailgate, you can slide in. We knew the system. We knew that if a maintenance boss, if a maintenance boss walked up to the back door, you know, to the back gate and yelled, hey, you know, maintenance, you know, gate, he'll look over and he'll see a regular boss man, you know, with an ID and let him out. He gets into the passenger side, I get in the driver's side and we drive off. And even the second guard tower waved at us. So we waved back, kept on driving the speed limit, which is about 20 miles an hour. They drove out calmly through the back gate to freedom. It took the guards hours before they realized the SKPs were not still somewhere on the prison grounds. How did it feel to be out there? Scary. Oh, man. It was... You're constantly looking over your shoulder, you know, it's, you know they're coming, you know they're coming. You know, we missed a roadblock by three cars. Murphy's looking out the back window and he's like, hey, uh, we just missed it because the cops were putting up the roadblocks already. We missed it by three cars. Good morning, ma'am, Highway Patrol. Y'all aware the prison escape? When On Death Row continues, a Christmas Eve heist and the death of a police officer turned the biggest prison break in Texas history into a nationwide manhunt. We now return to Joseph Garcia and George Rivas on Death Row. San Antonio has become the focus of the search because two of the escapees are from here. 29-year-old Joseph Garcia we embarrassed Texas, you know, the seven inmates that, uh, that escaped from Connolly. We, we embarrassed Texas very, very bad. You know, once you were past the, the roadblocks, it was like, we did it. We did it. You know, we're out. We're free. Now that you're out, you got to be smart enough to stay out, you know, and do what you got to do to stay out. And I was like, man, I just hope this lasts. Within the next two weeks, the SKPs committed two robberies. On Christmas Eve day, they planned their biggest heist at an Oshman's sporting goods store in Irving, Texas. This is the aftermath of the crime which bears the imprint of Rivas' usual approach. 
We were dressed as full security, full security uniforms and IDs, two of us. And the rest were shoppers, except for one who was uh, inside the vehicle. When I had gone to check out the store or stake it out, case the joint as they call it here in Texas, they had a little tag on their window that said that their security was provided by ADT Security. Well, we were economizing all the money we had, so we would shop at the thrifty stores, like a Goodwill. At one of those stores, I noticed they had a, a rack of clothing, of used clothing, of all these different kind of clothing from businesses. I saw ADT Security. So I got two shirts, black pants, a jacket that had security, a cap. Then I cut out some pictures from a newspaper, a Dallas newspaper, and went to a little Kinko's copy shop and using their computer and their Xerox machine, I made these little security alerts talking about what they call a snatch and grab. It's real popular where a group of people walk into a store, grab all handfuls of clothing, and then run out the store into a truck. There's other stores in the little shopping area, and I named one of the stores that they had already been identified there had they seen them here at this store. And strangely, some of the employees were saying, yes, I've seen that person, I've seen this person. They were circling, I told them, please take this pin and circle everyone you recognize. And I did that in order to get all those employees to the front of the store. So it was all your ruse. To get everyone there. And you were convincing. Yes. You and, sounded uh, like a real security person. Yes, sir. So you have it in you to look uh, reliable, yeah. trustworthy. You are calm. <sighs> you are a good actor. Yeah. Otherwise it wouldn't have functioned. Yes. This is the interior of the store after the heist. The Texas Sevens loot included $73,000, clothing and numerous firearms. But things did not go according to plan. So it turns out that a person that was waiting to pick up one of their employees, uh, her boyfriend in fact, uh, she saw something not right. She called one of her friends and to make a long story short, they called the police. Well, I had Murphy outside listening to the police scanner, so he notified me. We were hooked up just like this with walkie-talkies, and I let everyone know that if I say we're leaving, you stop what you're doing. Don't keep on grabbing nothing else, just leave. And I already had a pickup points. So I had an extra vehicle parked behind the business. I got back there, and they were not there. They were still inside the store. For four minutes, for four minutes, Mr. Herzog, and those four minutes changed the lives of all of us and that poor officer and his family. I was yelling into the walkie-talkie. All this time, Murphy outside is telling me that the dispatcher is calling more police officers, sending them over there. And all at this time, all they knew was a suspicious activity. They didn't know what was going on. They didn't know it was us. It was just suspicious activity. I wouldn't leave the guys there. So I stayed there yelling at the walkie-talkie. They finally came out. As they were coming out, the officer was already getting ready to pull up on us. We couldn't get out. So posing as security, I was gonna get as close to him and take him over, take his gun, handcuff him inside the vehicle, and then we'll leave. I reached back to pull the ID out to show the badge and the ID. So he'll recognize it. He'll feel comfortable with it when I come towards him. As I'm getting closer, I see his hand coming up like this. I drew my weapon at that time, and uh, I shot through the windshield and shot the right shoulder. I yelled, don't move again, and that's when I saw flashes. He had his window rolled up, and I saw these yellow flashes like this, and then I heard the sound, and I felt the piercing pain right through my stomach. And that's when I fired the three fatal shots. I fired three more shots, and I know it was in the head area. And you were also shot? Yes, he shot at me seven times. The authorities say that my... You mean the police officer, yes. or was it your own people? Well, the police say my own people shot me, but that was impossible. They were behind me. I have the wounds in front of me. You were shot where? Through my stomach. I had turned to the side I'm like this. I got hit through the stomach and then through my leg, front to the back, mm -hmm. and my stomach in and out also. So 
It's strange that the law of physics changes in Dallas County when it comes to bullet trajectories. Forensic evidence tells a different story. Rivas most likely was hit by his own men who opened a barrage of gunfire. The police officer never had a chance to draw his weapon. Was there only one person who shot at the officer or were there several? I, I wasn't on the back dock. I was still in the, I was still in the, I was still in the, uh, Inside the I was, story. I was still inside the store. I was tying up these people. I heard the gunshots. By the time I got out, it was over. Mm -hmm. It was over. And I noticed through court records that four people with their own words, claim to have shot at the officer. Mr. Grievous, fact is you shot and killed this officer. He was a police officer. He was in uniform, in an official car, on duty. And now what, what makes it even worse is it is Christmas Eve day. Think about his family. Every Christmas I do think about his family. Every Christmas I think about his family. He had a one son that I know of and... Uh, Waiting for daddy to come home for and celebrating under the Christmas tree. And instead of opening presents, they had to go identify him on Christmas day. I know, I know. and. Uh, so it I'm doesn't not, matter how, how heavily matter. he was armed. It doesn't matter. By the way, you had 40 guns yes. that you had robbed. Yes. You could have outgunned him, you outgunned him anyway. Yes, sir. And, and how, does it, how does that feel to you now when you think about the officer? The fact that you don't hear of any robberies, even though we are so armed now with more than 40 weapons, we're more desperate now because a police officer is dead. You don't hear of any more crimes in Colorado. I had given up robbing after that. And uh, I don't consider myself a real tough guy or a hard guy. I will fight you if you're just going to kill me. But I held no malice towards him. And I didn't want him to die. And how do you live with it now? I have no choice. It's either suicide or just make the best of each day. And uh, I'm facing execution by the state anyways. And of course, there's always a regret. Not only the police officer, but now two men who are my friends and four others here that are sentenced to death. I carry all of them, and uh, you planned it all. Yes. Eventually, the Texas Seven made their way to Colorado, where they holed up in this trailer park, posing as a group of missionaries. Almost four weeks later, police received a tip, and they apprehended all of them with the exception of one who committed suicide rather than be captured. The remaining six summarily received the death penalty, including Joseph Garcia. He most likely was not involved in the actual shooting, but the law of parties ties him to the murder. With a fate that certainly awaits him, Garcia's only escape is his dreams. Do you dream? Do you dream at night? Mm -hmm. Yes, I do. You dream of what? I dream of past events. I dream of my ex-wife. Uh, I dream of... But always events outside of prison. Yeah, yeah. Prison doesn't exist in your, no. in your dreams. No, no, no. That's, uh, when I wake up, that's my bad dream there. You know, just seeing these... Yeah. See, you know, it's... I, 
it's rough waking up to four walls, you know, and, and just knowing that you can't get out, you can't walk along the street. Do you see any chance for clemency? Not from, not from this state, no. No, sir, I don't. Uh, do you know about your execution? Is there a date? Uh, when is it coming? It could be any day now, to be blunt about it. Uh, me and one of the guys, Newberry, our last appeal with the Fifth Circuit was denied us. So now it's the Supreme Court, and I'm not expecting nothing positive from the Supreme Court. And to be blunt, I don't want another life sentence. I told you earlier that I was originally sentenced to 18 life sentences. When we escaped, the prison system ran court on us and uh, without us present. And they gave me another 13 aggravated lives. One aggravated life sentence for every officer that we tied up. They charged me with aggravated kidnapping. And they stacked, they added those life sentences to my 18 lives. So I had 31 life sentences. And then they gave me a, a 99 aggravated sentence for taking that truck. And as I said in my trial, and it wasn't a ruse, it wasn't acting, I don't want another life sentence. What they call the death penalty, I call freedom, because one way or the other, I'm going to have it. Do you have any hopes that you eventually would avoid a uh, death penalty? I had a vision. Yes. I had a... I, I want to stand on that. Uh, I remember... I remember in this dream, I'm looking at a birthday cake, and on this birthday cake it has two candles on it, and it has 99 on it, and I can hear people. I can't see them. There's a lot of people around, and I can hear them yelling, you know, Poppy, blow out the candles, you know, it's, it's your birthday, you know, and I, and I know it's a happy moment, and I can see this cake. It's on a big table. But I'm only staring at the 99, the candle. And it's your cake, and you're well, 99 years old. I don't old. know. I don't know. I'm, 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 I'm seeing out of my eyes. But when I go to put my hands down on the table, I realize that my hands are old, you know? And I realize that it's me because I see this tattoo on my hand, right? And I'm going, wow, you know, this is, here I am at 99. And I go to blow out the candles and I wake up. So I want to stand on that, you know. I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to, I got the faith that I'm going to live till I'm 99.